I was trying to work in British Airways. Like, me, I was just trying to be a flight attendant. Just give me food. Let me just be going from country to country. Like, I'm not about this life. I don't want to be on ground. Just give me the blue uniform. Let me be going, you know? <laughs> and I remember, um, Atris was like, like, why are you not working with your dad? I was just like, hmm, like, me, I beg, I beg. Like, it wasn't, like, it was, it was a question, but just, like, you know how someone will ask something, and it didn't sink. Until when I heard that Bible verse, and I was just like, okay, like, this is my future. Like, God is calling me into something. But I'm very stubborn. <laughs> so. Hey, guys. Welcome to How They Did It with Trisha Biz. On this show, I take you behind the scenes of successful African entrepreneurs, change makers, and creators. Showing you the journeys that led to their success. All right, guys. Today, I'm live on radio. I'm a radio DJ. You know you race me. Anywho, I am in the studio of 88.9 Brilla FM, Africa's first sports radio station. And I'm going to be talking to the CEO, who is now the second generation of this business. The business was founded by her father, Dr. Larry Izamoje, and now he has handed it over to the next generation. So we're going to be talking about how this business has done it over the last two decades. Let's go. Okay, guys, so we are here with the delectable lady in sports. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Debbie, um, the chief of person officer of Brilla FM. Yes. No, Brilla FM, sorry. I, I can't help you. <laughs> um, and so we'll just start from the top, top, top. Business is how old? So we're 20 years wow. now. So Brilla FM is 20 years. At least that. Big I'm, deal, right? I, I can call older sister. <laughs> Um, how did deal. the business start? I know the business started with your dad. Yeah. So how did he start it? Mm. So my dad um, used to be a big journalist. So now I'm giving you the story how they gave me the story, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he used to be a massive journalist okay. and um, well known. He would go from, he used to work in OGBC and he was known only for sports. He was okay. purely in sports. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the story, how they told me the story, right? Um, so my dad used to be a huge sports journalist. I mean, he still is a big deal in my eyes, right? And the eyes of a lot of people that saw him at his prime. And he used to go for, he used to work in OGBC. So he was well known for delivering sports in a very different way. Okay. Now, I don't know how to do it the way he, even he still has it, obviously, that's his mm. thing. But he would speak fast and deliver sports in just a special way. Now, at the time where he was a journalist, there was no social media. There was there was no there wasn't quick access to sports news, especially in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You know, even like as a, as an African country. So he would give access interviews to like people would hear the voices of like players abroad. You know, players that were playing in Super Eagles abroad. So it was a big deal to have that kind of access to those players and to have one man carry the stories, tell the stories of Nigerian footballers or African footballers. Um, I do know, so let me fast forward mm. to how they also told me the story. Mm -hmm. But I do know that in 2000, we got a radio license. So I don't... I. Let me know. I don't know how he applied, to mm -hmm. be honest, but I know that Obasanjo, it was Obasanjo's time in office. And at that time, the the NBC was looking for a way to change the media landscape in Nigeria. And so we they were trying to introduce something called specialized licenses, okay. where you would have niche stations. So you would have like a like a legal station, you have a sports station, you have music stations, you have comedy stations, mm. just like it is in most developed countries. Unfortunately, I think with time and with maybe lack of structure, some things haven't like stayed the same, but that was the plan at the time where we got our license. Now I'm saying we, like I was there in the story then, you know, but um, that was how we got our license. So we opened in 2002, first branch being Lagos, mm. um, it is 0.9. And then we opened in 2007 in Abuja and in 2011 in Onicha. 
And we opened in Kaduna, but because of um, insecurity and just a lot of things, I think also my dad having foresight, we had to kind of close down that business and move to Port Harcourt, which we, we just opened um, in 2022. See, so I'm saying it's like it's fiery, right? But um, yeah, so to God be the glory, honestly. But I think also from just being a radio station, we're a full-fledged media house now. And okay. I say this because we have... Um, Brilla.net, which, mm -hmm. you know, I'm very proud of because that was like a major thing that I introduced into the business when I came in seven years ago. Um, we also have our Brilla Sports TV. We're very quiet about it, even though it's part of the, the logo. So, so we believe in writing the vision, you know, until you can, you people you will see, see it, it. But, you know, we already know that it's something that is, is in the works. So that's basically the story of Brilla. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so do you know if this was like your, your dad's dream or things just happened and he... Only no, I know for sure. Time. For sure this was like... So let me even just you. I think even now um, with him like basically like stepping out, retiring and not all that, right? If you give my dad a mic, <laughs> any day you wake him up from sleep, like take this mic, please analyze this. He would be happy to just like he was born for the microphone. Like mm. he loves this. That's his baby. That's his dream. I think maybe what tires him out is the business aspect of, 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 of sports, which mm. is interesting because I'm the opposite. I'm more of like, give me the business, give me all the contract, give me, send me to all the meetings. Just don't put me in front of the microphone, you mm. know? So I think we're also like the perfect balance, right? Um, but I do know that this was his dream. Maybe he didn't think that he was going to birth um, Africa's first sports radio station because that's what we are. Okay. And that's what we were for the longest time. I think maybe up to like two, three years ago when things people started to like branch into, oh, let me add sports to my name, although I can't really do this possible. Let me just write sports that I'm a sports station, you know. Um, but yeah, I do, I do think that if he didn't end up birthing Brilla, God would have also put him in a place where he would have to run with the vision of sports in whatever capacity. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think he's a legend. Shout out to you, daddy. <laughs> Daddy's girl. I know. So why are you? <laughs> Why you? Why why was the torch passed down to you? That's very interesting. I don't think I've ever really. So my dad and I are not very mushy. Like we're not very. I won't say emotional because we're very emotional people. But we're not very. We don't have like deep or oh, you because I love you. You know. Mm. Um, but I think that he sees a lot of himself in me, and it's funny because I think that I see, especially now that he's getting older. I see a lot of myself in him. Now that I'm getting wiser, um, and maybe I've learned to also calm down versus when I first entered the business, you know? <laughs> I see a lot of myself in him. Um, I think also in terms of interest, um, um, we have similar interests. I also mm -hmm. believe that I earned his trust mm -hmm. because my dad believes so much in who he can trust and not just trust with money, <coughs> Not just trust with money or trust with capacity. Okay. Trust with, I know that you're going to get there. I know that you said, see, there are going to be thorns on the road. You're going to cry. You're probably going to be limping, but you're not going to stop until you get there. I think that's where me and him are very similar. If we both decide that we're going to do something, I don't know that there's anybody in this world that can stop us. And I do think maybe that's his why. But it's interesting because I have to go home and really yes. ask him, like, mm. why? Like, why mm. me, actually? But I think that is because he trusts me to, to finish what he started. Mm. Yeah. And maybe not finish. Maybe also hand it down to somebody else. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting. So, so when did you join the business? So I joined seven years ago. Ah. I'm becoming a mama in this, in this business. <laughs> so, but I joined seven years ago. But what's so interesting is I was always one leg in, one leg out. Because I had my own... I guess maybe that was God's way of preparing me for the journey. I had to go through my journey. I have something on my wall. So I have like a Bible passage on my wall. This is like mm. my why, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was, in, I was doing my master's. I was getting ready to move back to Nigeria. Um, this was 20, 2015, 2014, 2015. This was August. 
And I just remember hearing in my room, like just a certain Bible passage. Now, the night before, my friend Idris had told me, Idris is a Muslim. So, you know, honestly, like, God is so amazing because God will use anybody to speak to you about your future, right? Mm. It just had told me, because we're talking about the future, moving back, you know, getting jobs. I was trying to work in British Airways. Like, me, I was just trying to be a flight attendant. Just give me food. Let me just be going from country to country. Like, I'm not about this life. I don't want to be on ground. Just give me the blue uniform. Let me be going, you know? <laughs> and I remember um, it just was like, like, why are you not working with your dad? I was just like, hmm, like, me. I beg, I beg. Like, it wasn't, like, it was, it was a question, but I just, like, you know how someone will ask something, and it didn't sink until when I heard that Bible verse, and I was just like, okay, like, this is my future. Like, God is calling me into something. But I'm very stubborn. <laughs> so, so, I think for me, it was like, okay, I knew that God was calling me into this thing. I was like, okay, I'll go and do my own thing. I would sell hair. I'll be a makeup artist. I will own my own consultancy firm. I will do this. I will do every other thing apart from this, this one thing. Hmm. But every time I would go around <laughs> it, in my quiet time, in my quiet space, even in the times, I remember there was a time I was speaking in Babcock University for my um, consultancy firm. And I remember speaking there and feeling so lonely. I think that was the day that I decided, you know, more, no more running. Because it was a big haul. As I'm here, I, I almost like, I'm almost like going back. It was a very big haul, but I was so lonely. And I was with the mic. And I think just having that mic in my hand was my realization that I wasn't working in my purpose. Mm -hmm. I know how the Bible says it's better to be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord, right, than be a king. Yeah, I don't know, in the other place. I don't know the other place that the Bible calls, you know. But I, for me, I was like, okay, maybe I should just circle back a bit and start to find my way and start to even, like, show interest in this thing. Mm. And so for me, that's when I, like, started to put my two feet in the business, right? Mm -hmm. So from there, I worked in marketing team in Brilla, <laughs> worked with the engineering team, worked with security team. Works with transportation team, works with all the all the teams possible because I was like, okay, let me understand this How business from the ground up. And my dad did not believe in, oh yeah, my daughter, so come and be the ogre when you've not earned it. So I had to show him after a while that I I understood the business to a certain capacity mm -hmm. before in 2022, 2020 actually, um, I became chief operating officer of Brilla Media. Fantastic. <laughs> So, rewind to 2020, how, how were you able to work with the people on ground? Because um, these are people who know that she is younger than we are. So they, they've been used to your dad, who's way older, and now it's like the exact opposite. So how are you able to command the respect that you should have, you know, as a professional even though, yeah, we know that the society is, yeah. <laughs> um, and they are now in a male-dominated business. I know, yeah. I know. Um, <laughs> so there were definitely people that were like, yeah, this doesn't work, right? Mm. And I think what was interesting for me, entering into the business or entering into leadership capacity was seeing people that I expected to be on board, not necessarily be on board. So be on board with words. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, I got you. Oh, you're a new CEO. Oh, okay, I got you. But in terms of actions, not necessarily be on board. Um, but I think also what was very important when I became CEO was what I asked for was my cabinet. You know how every president has their cabinet. Mm -hmm. One of the things I told, because it was very... I, did, I don't know that I expected to be CEO so soon. That's the honest truth, right? Mm. I don't know. To be honest, I don't even know what I expected. Because my dad is very interesting. Because he's a process person. And he's a thorough businessman. And you will not enter any... You will not get a leadership role because you are his child. So I don't know that I expected it. But when he came, I was like, okay. I mean, if you want me to do this, then... 
I need my team because I've been here for about, I had, at that time I had been maybe like four years. So I was like, I've been here about, for about like maybe four years now. So I need, or like five years. So I've seen the people that I can work with. I've seen the people that I cannot work with. And I need this person, person A, person B, in what role? I need you to change this person from this role to another role because this is where this person's strength will be. Um, and I think for me, that was what happened. I think also I needed to have several meetings. Maybe that's also where I learned to talk so much <laughs> because I had to show the vision. I had to explain the vision. I had to make people believe that they could trust me, that... Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not going to let you go because of your age. If whoever needs to let you go, it will be because you're not being competent to where the vision is to get to. I think also um, my dad and my mom, because my mom is also a part of the business as a, as a board member, they were very helpful in seating people that were in the business for years. Because when I joined Brilla, there were people that were in Brilla that used to pick me up from school. Ah, the school runs. But they were in real life. We literally saw me as a child, bro. I saw him. For you to now say, you didn't send this email. Why? Then can I like, you? Like, you? That's what, because when I, when, the way I was raised, my mom said, call this person and That's how I was raised. So everybody was all put at that thing. Yeah. So transitioning from, I call this to Miss Stark. It was very, there were subtle lines that we had meetings of, this is where the business is going. But how do you have a meeting on, hey, I'm going to stop calling you uncle because you're no longer my uncle. Now we're doing business and we're doing business the right way. And without knowing you, you are touching or you're hitting on that person's ego, right? Yeah. So it was very, very, very interesting. I think what was also helpful because everybody that needed to step aside for the vision to grow, stepped aside without challenges or problems. Mm -hmm. And everybody that needed to come into the business, for the business to grow, came into the business without challenges or problems. Anybody that needed to transition within the business, did it without challenges or, or problems. Um, but there were lots of meetings. There were lots of HR meetings. HR was very instrumental because now much talking about over like you're changing it's almost like changing the whole structure of your business and then we're not just talking of one branch we're talking of four branches you're talking of over 100 people and then you're saying hey this person has been in marketing because mind you i was never a manager i was part of the team we used to eat in canteen together so it's like on this one thing you will not give you special office and you will we know so it was very but then i also had to handle myself because I had to humble myself. I had to say, okay, I had to have one on one meetings to explain to people. I also had to continue doing the things that I was doing to win in people's hearts. Because when I joined Brilla, there was a thing of, it's your dad's company. I was out knowing after like three years, I realized that nobody was saying, no, it's your dad's company. Nobody was saying, it's your dad now, you know? So I realized that I had more the hearts of people and I had to speak to the things that I was doing to win their hearts. Let me share one secret. Can't see. This is our Brilla can't see. I don't know what it does, but I just eating together, sharing a, a meal together. Just just say, hey, how's life? Well, how's that relationship? What happened? I didn't just give me to survive. Also sharing things in my personal life. It brought trust and also end trust into like the business. Yeah. Okay. So um, Brilla FM is functional in four cities. Yes. Which are they? So we're in Portacot, we're in Onicha, Lagos, of course, and Abuja. Fantastic. So how are you able to manage operations across, and all the four stations are 24-7, right? No, so no. we operate not 24-7 schedule. I okay. think since COVID, we've tried to be more realistic, especially with the cost of diesel, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but we have like different timelines where we operate. Sometimes we extend this, especially on match days, okay. you know. Um, so... Different cities have their different, different time. time. Yeah. Okay, so how, yeah. do you, how do you manage operations across both to ensure that 
around air, we're functioning as yeah. we should. So I think for me personally, as the team lead, um, I ensure that I'm very close to the leaders in those stations. Mm -hmm. So I'm not far to reach. I'm not hard to reach. One call, you can get me. You can say, hey, this is what is happening. This is what has just happened. We also ensure that we travel to those cities. We make sure mm -hmm. that people are constantly like in touch with what is happening in those cities. I think digital has also made it easy to build businesses where you are not necessarily based Presence um, mm. so digital calls zoom calls you know different calls as every time you know when i first took on this role we didn't have that um structure where everybody would be on the call at the same time so it was even awkward at first because like general meetings you'll be seeing the people so you see potakos branch you see lagos branch you see abuja branch you know and it's good because people feel like they have friends in other branches mm. that they haven't even ever met mm -hmm. before so i think that's how like we've been able to keep it or we've kept it going for this amount of time mm. yeah. this is me interrupting your watch time to tell you to like this video share it and also subscribe to my channel you're still watching how they did it with trisha biz i'm fascinated um so what, what do you think it stick i would say stick what do you think that helped bring up and grow all these years what's the word strategy that your dad holding to it in the year now it turned that blade to ensure that the bracket grew um i have so there's a brilla way. If I tell you the secrets, my computer, they might be watching it. So long. <laughs> well, there's definitely like a, my dad is a very excellent person in his ways, in everything that he does. Even in how he wakes up in the morning, he's just the guy and just excellent. I don't know how to explain it. So there's a habit of excellence in how we approach things. Mm -hmm. um, there's a brilla way. There's like a succession plan that hasn't necessarily been put in like it's just there it's in the air it's very hard for me to explain but now we're a bit more now that we know that it's our usp why it's more intentional about like writing it down so teaching people how to so for example with radio teaching people how to deliver news a certain way um, maybe not dr larry's way the way it was um 30 25 years ago but typing that same spice, that same, the way he delivered it, transitioning it to appeal to the young generation, right? So it's like, it's still him, but he means different people and different ways, right? So there's that. There's also structure, there's succession plan. About five years ago, we introduced, we turned our name from Brilla Broadcasting to Brilla Media okay. because we tried to expand the way we do things. And at that time, that's when we introduced visual radio. So it's not, it wasn't broadcast as usual, where you just have a Android key in a room locked up. At that point, it was, oh, let's put cameras in the studio. Let our OAPs just a certain way. Let's give our audience a feel of each OAP, how they look like, how they express the things they, they express when they're arguing about setting football clubs. So I think we've also been very in tune we're very in tune with market trends things that are changing i tell people that it's very easy for people and we've had many people push people from grilla we've had many people try to copy us mm -hmm. and i'm never i'm um, hardly ever maybe not saying never because there are times i'm like ah you know but i'm hardly ever threatened by competition trying to be like grilla because you can take the people from here you can take you can take everything, but you can't take the system that's in place. We have a system that works. I will have a system that even if you even if you remove all of us here, and that's not my prayer, even if you remove all of us and put hundred more people in that same system, it will work because it's just the brill that way. So now I've been more intentional about like writing it down so that for the next generation of Brilla team members, they would come and say, okay, this is what they did five years ago. Because also for me, thank God that my dad is still alive. So I can call him and say, hey, how did you get this partnership? How did you do that? But I also want a case where God forbid that he's not here anymore. The truth is that day will come because it's life. We want to ensure that our growth, our growth plans are in place. So we're very in tune with technology. We're very in tune with communication in-house. We ensure that we're not, we don't react. So when we start doing things, we're like, hey, relax, it's just a trend. 
were not very trend savvy, like oh, because we know that trends pass, but structures stay in place for years. So we're not easily shaking in house, and I think that that is what has kept us going over the years. Yeah. What what challenges come with running with running the operations? Because even though I'm not in this industry, I know that there's <laughs> diesel costs. <laughs> So, uh, what are the um, operational challenges that you know you encounter daily, and how have you been hmm. able to walk around it? So you have to, hmm. you have to just trust. <laughs> <laughs> you have to just. I think there's a part that comes with not knowing, mm -hmm. and I think for me, even as a leader, that's the hardest part because. I won't say I'm a control freak, but I'm a perfectionist. Like I like things a certain way, and sometimes not being in a city where you have businesses, you have to trust the word of the other person. Mm -hmm. If they send you diesel bill, for example, or they send you Nepal bill, and the thing has gone up from what you expect, you have to trust the person's word that there was actually no light mm. for seven days. Yeah. Even though in your head you're like, hmm, can Nigeria really do this to my business? You know, So there's, there's the trust aspect in expansion because when you expand it's mm -hmm. no longer about you it's about legacy and i think legacy sometimes sometimes people think oh legacy is just about your family but it's about other people building the culture imagine if we open like because we see ourselves as a pan-african business so we hope to open in kenya in south africa i'm not going to be i mean if you give me a private jet i'll be I'm happy to <laughs> you know so there's trust it has you have to you have to trust the people that are there you have to have open and honest conversations they also need to know that they can trust you so there's a place of trust and trust is two ways so they also need to know that they can trust you with certain information if not when they and also knowing that they have a leader that they can that listens to understand not oh i'm just listening because of let me just let's just be like i listen to you mm -hmm. so listen to understand that way they can even give you insight into what is happening in the city so the last um meeting i had with with the heads of stations in each department what we're speaking about was okay tell us the new radio stations that are that have entered your city in mm -hmm. in the last three months and what we need to do to upstage them quickly before they find their foot right so mm -hmm. it's or their feet it's very interesting it's very important to have common conversations but you have to trust because i can't be talking to you and they're giving me information and in the back of my mind i'm questioning everything that you're saying but it's hard because i mean we're in nigeria and you know i've heard of of things that have happened even before i joined the organization that would make anybody be like you know what maybe i should just leave human beings where they are right mm. but i mean it's what we signed up for so you have to keep going mm. so I, I hear you on trust however is there room for what what's the room for accountability or what processes are in place because um the average person you know likes to find opportunities when there is no system in place mm -hmm. like you know they'll, they'll, they'll trust me anyway so mm -hmm. i'm just going to present 1000 liters of diesel <laughs> You know, so is there any system in place that also mm. checks and ensures mm. that? So even though I trust your word, but mm. we we just get to balance mm. up. You know what's so interesting is that we have systems in place, but I also know that, and you know, like, so I, I, I work closely with my dad too, right? So my dad and I are very different in the sense that my dad mm. gives room for many chances. So ah. it's like, you make, it's like, he has a big heart, right? Mm. So, okay, you did this, don't do it again. I'm like, you have one try. I trust you. So my dad doesn't necessarily trust, but when you do it, it's like, okay, don't do it again. I trust you. But once you, that one time you show me who you are, when people show me who they are, I believe. So there's a place for making mistakes. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But there's also a place for criminal criminal offense where <laughs> that one you're out there's mm. no there's no discussion so i think also we have processes in place and thanks to our hr team right also i'm very big on body language conversations when you have i think you can see the person's hearts when you have conversations with the person mm. so when somebody's lying and that's why as a as a business person place of discernment has helped me in business because mm. there are times where you can tell it was just an error mm -hmm. there are also times where you can tell this was not an error but it was a the person needed to survive so how as a company do we help this person ensure that they don't make this mistake again or do something like this again i think we're also clear on our policies so um 
when you enter Brilla, the average person knows the do's and don'ts up to on air behavior, gifts from from um, stakeholders. Everybody knows the fine lines. So mm -hmm. if you cross it, it's not even me. I don't even have to have the conversation because there are many people that have the conversation before it even gets to my table, right? Um, so I do know that trust can be broken. Once that trust is broken, it's broken, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between like crimes in the workplace. Like, oh, this person committed a criminal offense. You stole this zoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a difference between that and just like fine lines where it wasn't intentional. Maybe the person thought they were trying to help the business mm -hmm. and, you know, it just did not work out for both parties. <laughs> Um, and since we're, I wanted to to speak, use to speak on being a woman in a male-dominated industry. So this is not even a brain life and thing. It is being female, being young. Yeah. I mean, an industry that does anybody who talks football or sports or mm -hmm. all of that, it's always men. Mm -hmm. You know, that we, we think about that. The other ways, the other fathers, the other, all of it. Yeah. You know, so how have you been able to land with your feet mm -hmm. in the industry? Did you get support? Do you have a mentor? And, you know, what advice do you have for um, other young women like yourself who are entering into male-dominated industry, mm -hmm. either as their business or for their corporate jobs? So there's this Olivia Pope scene. You know, I was a huge fan of Scandal, the series. Oh. And there's this dialogue she had with her dad where he was saying, you have to be twice as good to guess what they have. I don't know why I can't, like, every time, I, every time anyone asks me this question, that's all I think about because you have to, like, you really have to work twice as hard. You have to prove yourself. You have to. So for me, I think for me, what I try to do is I try to make sure that I'm as competent as I can be. I'm as prepared as I can be. So that when those doors are finally opened up to me, I am not like shaking, like, oh, where's my shoe? Let me not tie it, you know? I'm already ready. So once you open the door, well, just show me the seats. Let me sit down, right? And it's very hard to answer that question because it really is difficult working in a male-dominated industry because a lot of the issues we have are not on paper. They are not, they are in the air. They are not, it's, it's the way somebody looks at you before you answer a question. Or it's the way somebody feels like they need to know the score of last night's game before. Because, well, yeah, a woman is what's up here. A man, you win, chill, what? He walked in 1996, who won? He be in the night. She's like, bro, what does that have to do with this paper that we want to sign, right? So there's that fine, it's in the air. I can't really explain this, it's just there. But I'm always prepared. I'm always prepared. I know my onions. I'm constantly studying because I'm not going to blame you for my for my lack of understanding of my job. However, whether it be a man, whether it be a woman, whether it be a child, anything. So I'm always, I always ensure I'm prepared so that anytime I tell you, you are caught up, guys. Because you're trying to embarrass me, but you have any question I know it's and they were like, okay, what's next? Let's get down to business, right? I'm also very, I make sure that I surround myself with women that have been there, done that. I reach out to women in media. I don't care where they be. Like, I'm always reaching out to women. If she knows, like, I'm always, like, stalking. Like, hey, if she wear them, hey, you look nice, you know? Because I want to be, even if we don't have a close relationship, I just want to be surrounded by women that have been there and done that. And I also try to open up my office to younger women that I know that will one day be in the same shoes that I made. So it's a constant, it's a, it's a constant battle, really. But I think that the future is bright because now there are more women in sports. My mentor is Mrs. Aisha Faradi. So she's the chairperson of women's football in Nigeria. What there? And she literally, she did how she would, like, she puts me on that. Like, when I call, I should like, yeah, cry. Ah, hey. As a woman, they won't, they won't, like, that's not way she will start from. They won't cry, you know, so... I think when you speak to women that have been there, they also show you why be honest mentor because I've also had women that I tried to get close to that when like package everything I've been like, oh, you know. So I think having honest mentors, but also like being a mentor yourself. For Women's Day, what I did was I sat in my office with just two girls, 20 years old, 21, that want to be in media. I'm like, okay, how can I help? How open can I call you? 
when they are done with, when they want to do NYC, I know that I would want them to serve here. So just holding their hand because the truth is, I didn't necessarily have, I think whether my dad was a journalist, but like what if he is it or what if he was it? Who would have done this for me? And so for me, I want to be that to younger girls. Yeah. So how do you manage people? Um, because the average um, entrepreneur that I've interviewed, they have the same thing. It's hard to find good people. People don't stay, etc. So how um, how are you able to manage the talent here yeah. at Brilla? Um, especially with the fact that there's a lot of hopping that happens from place to place. How do you retain stuff? Mm. Okay, so for me, I manage myself first. Okay. So I don't even know if that's a good answer, but I manage myself first because I do think that I find it very difficult to manage anybody around me, to meet expectations, to even understand when people are fulfilling expectations, but I'm just expecting more because my energy is off balance, right? So I'm constantly journaling, I'm constantly in therapy, good or bad days, I'm constantly looking inward because... I have expectations of myself that I have to meet before I expect anything from my team. Mm. Now, once I'm sure that my own, I've taken care of myself, it's then difficult for the people that work for me because there's a certain standard of, of awareness that you have to come into the workplace with. I think for us, um, and going through, so Brilla has been in business for 20 years. When you're working in an environment or you're working with a company that has been in business for 20 years, there's transition that happens over time. So for us, we no longer see ourselves as an old company, like most people would say. We mm. actually see ourselves as a young company because we're going through a transition phase so there's what's happening currently in brilla is that we're transitioning into the new phase of what we know brilla can be mm -hmm. and it's also very difficult because the expectations from what brilla used to expect from employees is very different from what we expect now mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so in those days I, I i guess the thing was we'll just come and do your job just be excellent at the job but now we want you to be a team player we want you to dance on tiktok like how do you how do you tell the average person okay part of your job is that when we're doing this you dance on tiktok right so it's very the expectations are very different okay. we're like a little family and people say oh um, toxic companies call themselves family but it's not like that really why little family and i think that has also helped us manage each other because mm. not everything is oh hr not everything is email not you know sometimes it's just a conversation, conversation. sometimes mm. when you see that an employee is messing up it's because there's something happening with their wife there's something happening in their marriage. Mm. There's something happening with the child. Mm. So sometimes we try to ensure that we figure out what is happening in your personal life that is translating into business. And then if over time we don't see an improvement, maybe also we have like KPIs, we have little things. Each I'm, I'm harder on my group managers, the people that are closest to me. Mm. So I'm not, I think that maybe the, the rest of the team thinks I'm so cool. I don't know, guys. Mm. I don't know, you know. But I'm very hard on my inner circle. They're the ones that I speak to about vision constantly because I expect that once they stand up from that meeting, they are going to speak to their teams to about, okay, this is what we're trying to achieve or this is where we're going. In terms of people management, people will always leave. You know, my dad says something that if they don't leave, something must make them leave, which is death. And mm -hmm. it's not like we wish anybody death, but something will always make people leave your organization. I've learned not to hold on too tightly, you know, too with my whole heart. I have a very, sometimes, you know, you get close to people, you get close to their families, mm -hmm. but I've learned to ensure that people come and for the season that they are here, they play the role that they were called to play. I want everybody that comes to Brilla to feel like they were called to Brilla because I was called here, right? So if you are here and you know it's a calling, even on hard days, it's easy to show up. But if it's just, oh, just pay me salary after 30 days, then you will do anything. You would, it would be so easy for anybody, any of our competitors to call you and you will go because for you it's about the money. So for us, it's about the long-term vision. We don't make it about money, even though we pay well. We make it about the long-term vision, long-term vision even for their career lives. So even when coppers come, interns come, I'm like, okay, what do you want to achieve in five years? Because I want you to feel like even if you spend one year here, mm. when you leave, you're like, ah, no, Brilla gave me that what thing that I want to do in five years. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. So what are the future plans for Brilla? 
when when you when you see Brilla in five, ten years. So definitely other African countries. I know that because I want to be trapped. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely other African countries. Because I think that the sports marketing Africa is still on tap to me. Um, we would definitely go more into like storytelling, but maybe visual, you know, because I think that in 20 years we have done all that can possibly be done with, with, um, radio. And so what we tried to do five years ago was just try to try to open up that gap. Now, okay, let's go more into visual storytelling, telling stories of past footballers, telling stories of history of football in Nigeria, full sports development shining light on young sports stars in Nigeria. This one live in Africa. In Nigeria, if you go to the stadium, sometimes I just go there to go and see what is happening. There's a guy, there's a young boy, Sultan, it's a old boxer that we found. Talented young chap, talented. And I think the Lagos State government took over and started training him. That's what we want to do. We want to impact society because at some point, after 20 years, we realized that it's not just about to be not about making money, how about you hand nice houses. I mean, I like nice things, right? It's like, I don't play around like my rings, my jewelry, but business is really about impact the next generation. And I hope that in 10, five years, we would have been able to do that on a huge scale. Fantastic. Final question. This is a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to I listen to this trick question. Up your head, can you tell us um, how many people you, um, all of Brilla reaches through birthdays? Ah, but it did not. As I will put, I thought about this after you want. I know it's black, so I'm running the phone. I see you out. You love me, sitting back. No, no, thank you. Um, what? Ha! Try. Let me reduce this for you. Try to guess this one so that what are we doing the thing? <laughs> It's not the number. So I do think that in Nigeria, actually, I know. So not an entry question. And you know, in Lagos, about three million outstations, two, two, two million there about broadcast wise and global. So that's our digital platforms. About maybe another three million. So let me just let me do it well. We didn't do thousands of one year now. <laughs> but yeah. Well, let me just add everything together. No, let me just see. Let me just be polite. So that my computer is also shit. You are watching it. Let me see. Every day, 15 million. Every day. Monday, 15. Tuesday, 15. By Wednesday, 15. <laughs> well, we'll do that. Bring the money. <laughs> yeah, about, about 15 million. We had a huge reach. I think sometimes I'm even shocked, you know. So I've had to open up my platform, like my own personal platform to random people. Like it's funny, I posted a picture on Instagram today and there's this like particular guy that like one second after is like there, hey, looking cute. And it's weird sometimes, but then it also shows you and then my dad is like, ah, you're just, is, you're just starting. But it makes you realize how far your reach is, how far people that are not even calling the station are seeing and monitoring the progress of what's really happening here in this Nigeria. It's mm. so amazing. Interesting. Okay, so I know that you worked in marketing yeah. before you became management. Yeah. Um, and many people will not think that, oh, radio houses or media houses have to also market as well. In your mind, <laughs> you're like, oh, adverts just fall on your laps. <laughs> you know, so what's that one um, tip that you can give us that, you know, was instrumental to you bringing in partnerships and ads that a business owner out there can take and to look for deals? I think for me it was the digital aspects mm -hmm. because when I came in, it was just FM. We mm -hmm. had nothing else. And so creating a website, creating visual radio, because we're charging. So for every time we turn on our cameras in the studio, it's an extra cost. And then looking mm -hmm. for a way, looking for opportunities, even in the things that to innovate. So there was a way we had to collate. Okay, maybe if we if we put like your crawler, if we put a crawler with your brand name, it's an extra charge. Mm. Versus if we if we put a banner in the studio, it's an extra charge. We realized that there were multiple ways we could. My my clients yeah. are looking at me now like, eh, this is what you've been doing. But <laughs> we realized that there were multiple ways we could make money with just a single innovation mm -hmm. and i think for us it was just yeah it was digital really really we didn't when we created digital we didn't really have to 
and we had to market and tell people, hey, this is what we we're, this. we're doing now. Mm. But it was so easy. It was so seamless. It was it was so straight to the point. But also we had to plow back to because digital is forever changing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think for me, that's it. Great. Last word to everybody watching you and to um, entrepreneurs out there who um, have this burden like, oh, I don't want to join the family business or, oh, they're in that place where they're considering, should I, should I not? Whether it is as a child or as a spouse, one word that you can say to them. I think that you have to know your why. It's very important because you will give up. There are mm. many times that I've entered this, like my office, my room. I'm like, okay, God, I'm ready to move. And he's like, nah, stay there, you know? Mm. So if you don't have a strong reason, and it might not even be like a spiritual reason. I just have an amazing relationship with God, right? But if you don't have a strong reason why you are doing something, it might just be as it might just be that you love the person so much you want to help their business, you will give up because working with family, I think, is tougher. You will test the God <laughs> in you. <laughs> it's way tougher than just signing okay, up for random any people. random yeah. person's mm -hmm. job. And then there's the relationship aspect where it would also test that. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything has tested my relationship with my dad, with my mom with my sisters, because there are many stakeholders. Mm -hmm. As much as it's me and him that work daily, mm -hmm. there are many people that are also interested okay. in the output of what I do daily. So it's a huge sacrifice. You have to humble yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, have to, you have to really surrender, you know? Mm -hmm. You have to surrender. You have to know that there's a greater good. And I always tell people that it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So when I look at people online that are traveling to Maldives and traveling to Mauritius. I'm like, I love y'all. I'll see you soon. I'll be traveling soon because I know that I'm making sacrifices now that even my children mm. will be grateful for. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for having it's me. Been this was fun. Awesome. All right, guys. So see you in the next episode. Till then. Ta-da. <laughs>